Hello, welcome to part three on cranial cervical instability. Part one and part two, we looked at what atlantoaxial instability and cranial cervical instability were and how they are diagnosed, diagnostic criteria. And today we're gonna to look at rehabilitation method for cranial cervical instability and atlantoaxial instability. So I'm just gonna share the screen. So what we're going to start with is what does the literature say in terms of rehabilitation of instability in the cervical spine? And currently, unfortunately, at the time of writing this presentation, there is nothing published on conservative treatment, only surgical intervention. There are absolutely no guidelines on conservative treatment or any published guidance on the use of collars. Um, it's also not clear when to recommend a referral for a surgical assessment. And most of the research that we have looking at cervical instability actually comes from individuals who've had acute injuries like car accidents. Uh, but these individuals are not hypermobile. So the protocols used for these individuals are believed not to be particularly beneficial in the hypermobile community. So we will look at that. So things that we need to think about with uh, the cervical spine and how we treat cranial cervical instability is we need to be looking at the whole body. Uh, in this group of people, the whole spine uh, will be unstable and small alterations in posture can influence uh, the neck and the stability of the cervical spine. So our body will try and do its best to keep the eyes looking forward. So if we look at these images here, if your spine is curved like the red image, um, so the, the thoracic spine is what we call kyphos, the neck will start to extend in order to let the head look straight forward. So you get a little compensation and normally this wouldn't be a particular problem in the pop population, but because of the weight of the head and ligament laxity, this be can become a real problem in this group of people. And then you've got the other extreme where you've got an extended spine and you ended up, if you're uh, upper back, the thoracics are slightly flat, you'll end up with an overly flexed cervical spine. And, and as we know, um, that can also be a really big problem. So really, we're looking to optimize the positioning of how the head and neck sits and the head and neck will always sit over the rest of the body um, in order to balance and to look straight forward. So the neck is really going to be a bit of a victim to, to what goes on down below. And we have things, um, rotation and side flexion, which as it mentions here, will also um, alter how the head and neck sits. So there's something called form and force closure. Form closure is the stability gain through the closure of the joints. And some joints have more form closure than other joints. And I use the example of a hip and a shoulder because they're easy to imagine. I haven't given you those images, but, but you imagine the socket of a hip joint is going to be much deeper and more secure than the shoulder joint, which is a much flatter socket with, with much less stability. Um, so when we look at the images here, we're looking at images of say the pelvis, and this would be where the sacrum comes down with the legs and, and the, just the shape of the bones themselves cells give a certain amount of stability. And we call that form closure. So shape of the bones. Now we can have alterations in hypermobile, hypermobiles or people with EDS in form closure partly because when we're born as babies, we have a lot of gapping in between the joints. And some of the sockets that we form is through, uh, when we stand up is through pressure. So it actually creates that socket. So it's not entirely unusual to find hypermobiles with slightly shallower joints. So a little bit less form closure than you might normally see. 
And then we have force closure, which is the stability that's given by the joints and the ligaments and the muscles. So we know that there's an alteration uh, in the support from the ligaments with the hypermobiles. Some of them will have weaker muscles, some of them won't because mu uh, muscle tissue um, is not as dependent on uh, collagen. Um, so that's where in this group of people, we're really looking at trying to strengthen the muscles in the most optimal way we can. So a normal degree of form closure, as we said, will not be there with the hypermobiles. Uh, and so we are going to rely on that force closure uh, in order to gain stability. Um, and that will either be through exercise or surgery. So postural endurance per perception and force closure is reduced when you've got cranial cervical instability. And the belief is that the brain is likely to alter sensory input and possibly send pain because of this. There is likely to be an increase in shearing for forces and inappropriate increased stretch and compression with this modified input. So there are certain exercises, which are, if you were to go and do research studies on cranial cervical instability, as I said before, there's nothing that's been specifically done in the hypermobile community. So what you will find are protocols for people who've had injury. And um, those have not been proven to be particularly safe. So the deep cervical flexor routine, which you might come across, which is recommended in some studies, has shown little success in this group. And this is information um, through a physiotherapist, PhD physiotherapist, who is doing research on cranial cervical instability at the moment. So deep flexion exercises can be done under supervision, but they're likely to be done wrong at home. Um, and the hypermobile is always looking for muscular feedback. So they're likely to overdo it. They're likely to overflex um, too far. And the other exercises that often are recommended are isometrics against resistance, um, which are, these are all great exercises in the normal community um, are commonly given uh, for stab stability and they may, stabilize one or two joints, but because the entire cervical spine is likely to be unstable, it's very probable that they may shear a joint, um, which will really be defeating the purpose of stabilizing the neck. So the question is, what can we do? So um, the advice in working with AAI and CCI is based on both my personal clinical experience, plus advice given by Dr. Anne McCarthy, who's a practicing physiotherapist at the London Hypermobility Unit. And as I said before, she is a PhD and she's been given a grant and is doing research in this area at the moment. So um, what I'm giving you is based on both today. So all the exercises that we do, and this goes throughout the body, um, and this is with everybody really, but specifically more, even more important with the hypermobiles is that all exercises and progressions must be graded and very specific to that person. So there's no, um, you need to be looking at these people individually in terms of how they're graded, um, how quickly they go, how much load they can take. Uh, also, as we've said before, the body is a unit and trying to focus and stabilize one area is very unrealistic. So in CCI and AAI, stabilizing the neck without addressing the body lower down will be a futile exercise. So lying supine is usually okay with this group um, and feedback by lying supine, what you would start with will give some some information to the spine as to where it is. Um, and this can be in general, the best place and the most helpful place to start. So some form of neck support, if they're gonna lie on their back is beneficial to begin with. So I tend to use small Pilates cushions, but you can use bean bags or anything small and soft enough to support the cervical spine. So some of your clients will already be in a neck brace and initially I would keep them in the neck brace, it's fine. Um, 
there is always that controversy that neck braces weaken things further, but in this group, because of symptoms, it will be necessary to start them because their brain won't connect into the muscular system. Say if they have compression from the odontoid peg up into the brain stem, you need that collar to start to do anything. So the most basic functions such as coordination of limbs might not be possible in certain individuals without their collars on. But we would be wanting to progress to um, eventually being without the collar. So because the cervical spine is a particularly important area, the exercises below, if you're hypermobile yourself and you're watching this presentation, I would want you to be doing them with a qualified therapist. And that's not just a physiotherapist, it could be a sports therapist, or you could have a Pilates teacher or a good, if you've got a gym instructor who you really think is great, um, then you can show them this uh, presentation and get them to just oversee you as you do this. Um, and it could be worth obtaining consent before you start your exercises from your medical um, practitioner, uh, like I said, because of the importance of the cervical spine. So I've given us phases in terms of, of working through this. And phase one is just literally going to be about breathing. So breathing can be helpful to relax the client, reduce anxiety. It can help bring function to your stabilizing muscles of the torso. So your breathing, um, correct and good breathing is incredibly important for stabilization in the torso, probably more so than, than most exercises. Um, there's a lot of emphasis now on how we breathe, but initially I think it's important not to become overly um, focused on how you breathe, uh, but to just by, start by slowing the breath down. So the more you can slow that breath down and relax, the more we can come out of the um, sympathetic overdrive. So when we're breathing, we're going to try and exhale twice as long as the inhalation. So the inhalation is known to stimulate the sympathetic and the exhalation promotes the parasympathetic. And initially, because uh, this group of people do tend to suffer anxiety and stress, it's, it's a good thing to try and get them just to calm down before doing exercises. So phase one, we're, we're looking not just at um, what I would consider or people would talk about correct breathing, but we're looking at what the body needs to be able to do in a breath, whether it's a big breath or a small breath. And all of the bones, all of the rib cage should have the ability to move. Uh, often in hypermobiles, they look for stability here. So they'd come over dominant in something called the external obliques. They get very squeezy and they can be very, become very tight and they can end up with altered breathing patterns. So you can start by having your hands on collarbones and the upper ribs, and you're just gonna inhale through the nose and see if those ribs can lift. Can they move them? If they are extremely weak in their neck flexors, they may not have the ability to actually lift those muscles. There becomes an assumption that this whole group of people will be apical or upper breathers, which is not what I've actually found. So um, spend some time seeing if they can actually lift those upper ribs. And then we're going to move, or I tend to move down. So um, into the, still the upper quadrant of the ribs, but more the middle um, of the thoracics. And you want to inhale and allow those ribs. Again, it's a sort of outward and upward lift um, on the inhalation. And then just a gentle relaxation on the exhale and the ribs should just come back down to their resting position. So all of these things you wanna just do a couple times and you can use, if you're on your own, you can just use your hands on your ribs just to get a feel of whether those ribs are able to lift and widen. Keeping that exhalation nice and slow and keeping as relaxed as possible. And then we can take it down into the lower ribs. So you're gonna breathe into the very lowest part of the ribs and those will move sideways like bucket handles and lift upwards. So you wanna really get a sensation of movement in those ribs as you inhale through your nose. And then again, you're exhaling and it just comes back down. 
And then finally, we, we need to see what the abdominals are like because it is also quite commonly seen um, for hypermobiles to be very much held in the abdomen and the pelvic floor. So really thinking about relaxing the pelvic floor so that the actual diaphragm can descend on the inhalation is a good thing to cue or a good thing to think about. So breathing in through the nose, feeling like you're filling up a balloon in the abdomen, and that's the whole of the abdomen. So checking out whether the, the inflation is just in the upper abdomen, the middle or the lower, we want them to be able to to inhale or we want you to be able to inhale into the entire ab abdomen. And then as you exhale you, uh, and you start to relax on the exhalation, the, the abdominals will start to come back in on their own. So you shouldn't need to actively try and get the air out of your lungs. If you're using the diaphragm correctly, there is a recoil action and the belly will come back down and the ribs will come back down all on their own. So moving on with this, rather than focusing on what we would call a diaphragmatic breath, I tend to focus on the areas that were difficult to move. So you would spend some time, whether it's the upper quadrant or the lower of the abdominals, you would spend some time just breathing in, trying to get that mobility and that movement through that area of the body. And as I said before, um, in order to stabilize the neck, we have to have good function below it. And if we're really um, gripping in the back of the ribs or we're gripping in our abdominals, then we won't be um, stabilized optimally or standing optimally, and that could affect the neck. So phase two starts with a TheraBand. So I, with next cranial cervical instability, start with the lightest band. I've got the medium one here, which is the blue. Often it will be a yellow or a red, the lightest one. And we're gonna start on the floor. So instead of uh, the other exercises, the neck flexion and the isometrics, we start with a clinny head, uh, clinny band on the head uh, with the idea that you are lifting your head into the band. So what we're looking at is axial lengthening of the cervical spine and just starting to get the small stabilizers of the neck uh, functioning. So light TheraBand over the top of the head, either held down with the hands or you can get by clips or you can tie it um, under the armpit. There's different ways if you don't, if your hands aren't great and they can't hold them or that creates problems. So this um, has proven in my hypermobiles with cranial cervical instability, this seems to really um, connect them into the rest of their body. It's a bit like plugging the light uh, socket, the plug back into the light socket. They feel like they have better coordination and recruitment. And I think it's simply just as they lift up into that band, they're just putting the, uh, the cervical spine and the brainstem into a better place. So I will do normal little exercises like a Pilates knee float or bridging, things that start to get the legs working, that start to get the, the, the gluteals working, the abdominals working, the hips, the hip flexors working, start to do little low level exercises with the band over the head. And we can start to increase the strength of the band as they feel um, it's easier to hold the head up into the band. So, we continue to challenge by then going into the upright and supine position. So the idea is to maintain a good spinal position and a good head posture in sitting. I've tied that band as you can see, so I can relax my arms here. And I'm really getting that length or that send, sending my head up into that band. And it's harder than it looks. So it may be that they can only hold it for a few seconds to begin with, but you wanna then start to increase the time that they can hold that head up. Um, and hold the whole spine up um, without collapsing. And then you wanna start to increase that band strength. So um, I recommend that they sit in front of a mirror 
uh, and try and sit right on top of their sit bones so their, their pelvis is sitting as correctly as possible. Um, a lot of times you'll find that the, the um, chest is collapsing. So you'll find that they're often um, the clavicles and the sternum are sinking down. So rather than just telling them to sit up straight, I tend to cue the sternal bone and the clavicles to lift rather than gripping them back. Um, because unfortunately what they can do is then grip the shoulder blades together to stabilize themselves. And then they end up with issues with shoulder mechanics. Um, because if you're stabilizing your spine through holding your rhomboids, then when you lift your arms, you're not gonna be able to let it go. So it seems to be a much better cue to cue from the front than the back in terms of sitting up correctly. So um, I often do see this holding pattern in the back. So an overly flat thoracic spine where you get either winging scapula or retracted uh, scapula where what they are actually doing is not using their spinal extensors, but they're using their rhomboids um, to really hold themselves up and also to, to feel like they're holding their shoulders onto their bodies. Um, and then you get, it, it, issues with um, subluxations and, and odd things going on with the shoulder joint. So you wanna think about if they're a bit like this, maybe letting them sit back in a chair for feedback often, or they're lying down. They need something in order to know where they are in space, in order to just relax the thoracic spine back a little bit and then just to keep the eyes looking straight forward. So you don't need to adjust the head and the neck itself if you adjust the spine lower down. It may be um, in this group of people that if they are, have really unstable shoulders as well that you need to address the shoulders almost um, at the same time or before you're able to address the neck. So we continue on with the phase three and with the band and we try and bring things into more function. So maybe them sitting at a desk, if they're a desk worker, um, going from sit to stand, squatting, keeping that neck posture so they're not shearing the head forward as they start to come up from sitting and then taking a step forward again. So these are all areas or movements where they may start a movement by she actually shearing the cervical spine. So we keep that clinny band on, we keep that sense of lifting up into the clinny band as you start to make the movements or to sit doing a task such as at the desk where again, you can fall into that position where you might shear the cervical spine. None of these things should be bringing on symptoms. So the band should be light enough and, and the positioning good enough that they aren't bringing on symptoms. And if they do get symptoms, you need to go back um, a step and, and continue so that it is very graded in the progressions. So phase four takes you to a protocol that is recommended by Emma McCarthy. And this is where she really actually starts with her um, clients. Now I've taken my clients uh, back into the clinic band because the clinic band for me personally, as somebody with EDS, I found gave more feedback. It's more of a closed chain exercise. And if you start to put the book on your head, you're then um, looking at a more of an open chain exercise. And that will give you um, at a more multi-directional stability challenge, which is great, but you need to be ready for it. So um, again, remembering that the spine, the cervical spine cannot be trained in isolation. So you're gonna be looking at their positioning from the feet up when they do all of these um, progressions and exercises. So we do sitting with the book on the head and you start with a very light book. Um, and really, again, it's about what they can have on their head without bringing on any symptoms. And it's, you can increase it by the increasing the time that it's on the head, or you can increase by increasing the load, and then you can start to increase both. So you're going to progress from just sitting to sitting and coming into the upright position again, and adding simple tax tasks on such as walking and working at a desk. Um, and again, the weight should be gently increased based on comfort and staying symptom 
free. So you can start to just gently add on a slightly heavier book. So you keep adding on the weight. So this is really based on the thought process that um, when you look at certain cultures where they carry water and weights on their head, they can carry up to, it's an incredible amount of weight. Um, uh, I don't know the exact figure, but they carry a really quite a lot of heavy weight on their head and neck and cervical spine. And you know, the, the body can deal with that. So we keep progressing in terms of weight. You can buy these um, weights off Amazon or off um, different sites and they're like beanbag weights and they come in different, um, they usually come in a set of three uh, where they are sort of five, five kilos and then going up. So you start to now progress into the weighted beanbags and it's the same protocol. So you start with the sitting and tolerating the load, not and always staying symptom free. And then you start from the sit to stand and the walking, and you can start to gently rotate the head around as well, just challenging uh, that they can keep that spinal control of the cervical spine with the weight. So the next phase, phase five, is more per perceptive training um, with a laser. So you can get these, um, you can buy quite simply these um, devices that go onto the head. And then you have like a little laser pen that just fits into the front and you can have a target. And the idea is that you can keep your eye on that target. So you would start with the eyes open and you would control rotation, say taking the head to the left or the right and then being able to keep it level. So it's not waving up and down and then you're able to bring it back to the middle of the target. And then eventually you will take the head um, into rotation or a little bit of flexion and extension um, keeping the range minimized and you would close the eyes and see if they can actually bring that laser um, back to the center of the target, uh, which will eventually start to teach the brain and teach them more proprioception in the cervical spine. So they then it becomes a more natural way to move. And then phase six, we will, and this is the final phase, you keep the weight on the head. So you haven't taken the weight away. Um, and then you start to add on perturbations such as being on a gym ball or a balance pad. And this is the final phase because generally speaking, where there is perturbation is where this group of people will be most symptomatic. So you wait until the very, very end before you place anybody on anything that challenges the stability or, or the floor moving around. Um, so final stage will be feet on the ground, balancing, moving the head, keeping the control. And then on a gym ball, you can be rocking, you can be lifting one leg, both legs off the ball and maintaining that cervical stability. So thank you for listening. I hope you found this um, useful and um, I will be hopefully bringing another set of um, exercises soon, probably for the foot and the ankle and the knee. And I um, thank you for listening.